You know, to be honest with you, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I thought all my problems would be gone. You know, if I would just listen to him, listen to the ways he taught me to live, things would be fine. But I, I continued to have such horrible thoughts. I felt like I was being drawn back to that, that my old life, you know, like I was being drawn back to my old self. I couldn't understand what the problem was. You know what the problem was? It was me. I was the problem. How could I possibly be a Christian and cling to my past like I have been? I felt like I was stuck and I felt like there was no way that Jesus could love me and I felt like there was no way he could use me. But you know what? That was a lie straight from the gates of hell. Because I read in Peter, 1 Peter 5, 8, it said, be vigilant, be sober-minded. Your adversary, the devil, creeps around roaring like a lion to seeking who he can devour. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty scary to me. But then Jesus led me to Galatians 4, 7. I'm no longer a slave. I'm a son of God. And if I am a son of God, I am an heir through Jesus Christ. Do you understand what that means? That means that everything that Jesus has, it's mine too. That means that all the authority that Jesus has over Satan, I have the same authority. <laughs> so when, the, when Satan starts roaring at me, he has no claws and he has no teeth. The only power that Satan has over me is what I give him. So, so why do I live like I'm defeated? Why do, why do I live in such bondage? Why do I continue to drag this ball and chain around with me? Why do I continue to gripe about a wonderful life that he's given me? You know, I felt like I was in a trap. Like the children of Israel back in Numbers. I mean, God pulled them out of Egypt, out of slavery. And still, he gave them everything they wanted, and yet they were still murmuring that they'd be better off back in Egypt. Really? I mean, it's like they didn't know who they were. It's like they, they, they couldn't comprehend what it meant to be a, a son of God. It was like, you know, they're having an identity crisis. I mean, if God's for them, who could be against them, right? But still, they clung to their past. It was more important for them to live in their past than it was to go forward with God. And again, you know what? I was doing the same thing. Understanding who I am in Christ changed my whole perception of bondage. Okay, if I'm a child of God... If I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I have everything that he has. He did all the work. I get all the rewards. Do we understand that, church? Do we really understand that? I mean, God has made it perfectly clear who we are in Christ. Do you believe that? Now it's up to us to move forward with Jesus and show Wichita, the love of Jesus Christ and the love of our church, our church family, okay? We are a church family, right? Do you believe that? And as a church family, we're going to have disagreements. It's the way it goes. You know how many times I've wanted to smack my two brothers and my sister? And it goes without saying how many times they wanted to smack me. But you know what? At the end of the day, they're still my family, and I still love them. And I would do anything in my power to make it right. It's the same way with the church. Revelations tells us, it says, I've seen your works, but you're neither hot or cold. And so you're not hot or cold, you're lukewarm. And I will spit you out of my mouth. Is that who we are? Is that who we are? Because I refuse to be lukewarm not going to do it. I want to know. I want to know the future God has for our church. I want to know the depth of God's love, and I don't care how deep it is. I'm going to jump in it. 
and I'm really tired of carrying this ball and chain around. And you know what? This ends now. Amen. And who's with me? Thank you, Kevin. I don't know how I'm going to work around this ball up here, but uh, we'll find a way to do so. Bondage, identity crisis. What is the church's identity? You know, a couple weeks ago, the youth had the services, and they put on a drama, and it was very effective as to how Satan throws things at young people, and not only young people, but people my age as well. You remember the drama how it was back and forth? They were all dressed in black. And I tell you, bondage is something that all of us at some time in life are going to have an issue with. I think about the straight jacket last week. Couldn't get out of it. Even if he wanted to get out of it, he didn't know how to get out of it. And the shackles and the ball and chain. Go back a little bit to last Sunday's sermon. I talked about the bondage, self-inflicted, bondage that others inflict upon us. Sometimes it's a thing, such as finances, health. But I got thinking about my dad. A number of years ago, when I first got into ministry, I was so identified with my father that if anybody would ask me, what do you believe about this scripture? Or what do you believe about this topic? I would always say, well, my dad believed this. And that went on and on and on. And finally one day I realized that I was chained to my dad. I was in a straitjacket to him. And I thought, you know, I'm 40-some years old. I cannot allow my dad to put me in that bondage. It wasn't something he wanted to do. It was something that I was allowing to happen. And I finally decided at that point, as much as I love my dad, and as much as I thought he knew about the scriptures, that I was going to be my own person. And it wasn't what does my dad think about a particular topic or scripture, it's what does Al have to say about it and to think about it. It was an identity. You see, I was identified as my dad instead of who I was. And we talk about identity, we're going to put a scripture up here. And when it comes to a church identity, we're going to be talking about that today. There are many things that we can be identified with. And the one I want to talk about, to begin with, is found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20. And it's the Great Commission. Let me read it to you. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And so when I look at any church I've ever been involved in, this is one of the identities that we have is the Great Commission. In other words, are we winning people to Christ? We know that we've had at camp, vacation Bible school, we have children, we have youth, but how many salvations do we really have, and can we be identified with reaching people for Christ? How many people do we baptize? You see, a church is different than any other business in town. You go down to Kmart, they don't have a blue light spatial. Hey, we have baptisms today for $15. <laughs> they don't do baptisms. That's what we do. That is our identity. We're to make disciples, we're to baptize them, and we are to teach them, teach them the Word of God. And then the fourth thing that we do is we teach them to obey or disciple them to apply the Word of God to their lives. Now, there are a lot of things that we can be identified with as you go through the Bible when it comes to the church. I think at Glenville, started what, back in the 50s? In all of those years, you have been identified, starting from the beginning. My wife and I have been here seven years. 
And so we haven't been identified with all the things that you have been, but some of you have been here for the entire 50-some years. You have been identified at one time with a great bus ministry. You probably think back to that time when they had a great bus ministry here at this church. I think that you have been identified with missions down through the years. You have been identified with different personalities, different pastors that have come, that come and go, music, whatever it may be. A lot of personalities that you have been identified with. A lot of different issues that the church has been identified with. And you begin to think, you know, why can't a church just have an identity that started 50 years ago and stays that way throughout eternity? Because God just doesn't work that way. Everything's going to change somewhere along the line. And so we're going to look at identity. What do we do with the identity that we have today? And what can we do for the future? The first thing we're going to do is get rid of this bowling ball. As you can tell, I am about to step on that. <laughs> I'll just throw it out there to you, brother. There you go. Get rid of that thing, all right? So I want, to, I want to go back to the children of Israel for just a moment. And I want us to think about their identity. And then we talk about the church. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down upon the church. A great power came upon the church at that day. That's what they were identified with. Souls were saved. People were baptized. Great Miracles were taking place. I don't think we're any different today than what they were in that particular day. I don't know whether we identify with that today or whether we don't. And oftentimes when we lose our identity, then we're in what we call identity crisis. A crisis is something that we're uncertain about where we're at. Sometimes we're a little bit confused. It's that way in my own personal life with my identity. Let me give you an example a personal identity that we can relate to a church. I can remember a lady one time that had issues with her mother. They fought all the time. And they were angry with each other all the time. And every time you was around the daughter, how you doing? Well, I'm doing okay, but you know, my mother and I, we just don't get along. Let me tell you what she does. She belittles me. She tells me I'm no good. She just constantly is, is on me about my life, not doing this and not doing that. And she said, let me tell you what my mother's like. Well, a week later, you would talk to her and say, well, how are you doing today? She says, let me tell you something about my mother. My mother and I, we don't get along. I heard that story a hundred times if I've heard it once. She was identified with that story. And she wanted to be identified with that story so everybody could say, that no good for nothing mother of yours? I feel so sorry for you, what your mother has done to you. And so we had a Bible study about how to forgive. And she started in on the Bible study. The second lesson was about, well, what you do, you need to, if it's a mother, a parent, a child, you need to go to them and you need to forgive them. Needless to say, she never came back to the Bible study again. Why did she not come back? Because she was going to lose her identity. And she loved that identity. And whatever happens to us personally also happens to us as far as the church. Sometimes uh, we may say, well, this is what I want to be identified with right here. And so every place we go, well, this is what we are. And oftentimes, if there's an identity crisis, there is so much uncertainty and confusion that sometimes we don't really know what God wants for us. And so when you look at Israel, God had given them a great victory. They were in the bondage of Egypt taskmasters over them. God brings them out. They're on the way. They're standing at the Red Sea. 
they're looking across that sea. How are we going to get across the Red Sea? And then they begin to look behind them, and they see the Egyptian soldiers coming, hundreds of chariots, horsemen and horses coming. And all of a sudden, God just simply said to Moses, take the rod that you have in your hand and put it out over the water. And God parted the Red Sea. And the Israelites begin to walk across on dry ground. There they are. God's working a great miracle within their life. But the Egyptian soldiers are coming also. They're out in the middle of the Red Sea. It's interesting. It's kind of funny. God causes, causes their wheels to fall off of their chariots. Can you imagine what that must have been like? And they begin to say, well, we, we can't get anywhere here. We've got to get off of these horses and off the chariots, and we have to start walking. The Israelites, they get across. They turn around. The Egyptians are still in the Red Sea. And God said, Moses, Fifty years ago. And that's what they wanted. To go back. And I go back and think about my own personal life. Growing up in a little old country church. We didn't have any heat. We didn't have any electricity. I really don't want to go back to that. Would you? And, uh, but things are different. Culture changes. But I want you to know something else about the Israelites. Where God wanted them to be was in the promised land. This is found in Numbers chapter 14, verse 7 through 8. Joshua and Caleb said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, 
a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Now, this is a question I would present to the church today. What do we want as a people? Do we want to stay where we're at and oftentimes experience confusion, uncertainty, not knowing exactly what God's doing in our lives? Or do we want to go back to where we were years ago and experience what we experienced years ago? Or, listen to this, do we want to go where God wants us to be? Now, if we go there, it's probably going to change. Life isn't going to be the same. It's going to be unpleasant. It's going to be painful. But I guarantee you this. If we allow our church to go where God wants us to go, it'll be pleasing to God. It'll be acceptable to Him. It's a great land where God wants us to go. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's a place that we've never been before. And it should be a place that we've never been before because God doesn't always stay back where He used to be. You know, the Bible says God never changes. But the fact of the matter is, he doesn't change. But how he deals in the life of human beings and people has changed from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. From the time of innocence, establishing government, under the law, under grace, the millennial reign, eternity, God moves. And so Israel... There they are. Now here's what happens. The identity theft takes place. Satan never wants us to move forward. He doesn't ma- uh, it doesn't matter to him if we move backwards. But the identity theft, it is lost. And it will be stolen from us when we are most vulnerable. They had just had a victory. I was thinking about uh, Glenville having pastored in Valley Center. I've met pra- probably all your pastors that you've ever had. And uh, when personalities come in, people get attached to them, whether it's in pastoring or in music or whatever it may be. People get attached. And you've had some great pastors here in the past. When Pastor Bruce came something like 16 years ago, you were at a particular point at that time. You was really wanting leadership because obviously at that particular time uh, the leadership had been waning and you were wanting somebody to lead you to something great. And to be honest with you, a lot took place. The identity of the entire church has changed. For one thing, you built a new building, new pastor, music man, people, drama, I can remember the drama just boom, 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 just in your face type of thing. You were identified with that. And it all worked out great. And you grew numerically, tremendously during that period of time. That was your identity. But things change. Personalities leave. Not the same people. Talents and abilities leave. So consequently, the things that you had back here, today, if we would be in a state of confusion, some would be saying, well, we need to go back to that. And that might be a good thing, but it might not be a good thing because that, not, that might not be where God would want us to go. See? Might be new personalities and new talents, new abilities. We say, well, we run six or seven hundred and we had all kinds of things going on. You know, if we really turned it over to God, we might be running two or three thousand. If we could trust him. But I'm not sure whether we can trust him. Because he may take me someplace where I don't want to go. Because either I'm satisfied where I'm at or I want to go back. You know, somebody has said tradition is something that you want to use as a guidepost to guide you 
but not a hitching post. <laughs> you don't want to hitch up to it because it's going to end up just like the bowling ball. All you're going to do is just wander around and around because I guarantee you, God is moving. And so Satan set a trap for them. They had just come out of a great victory, and now they're murmuring they are wanting to go back to where they came from. So I want to talk about a church. How do you know if as a church we are where God wants us to be? Or at least we're heading in that direction. Let me give you a few things here in your bulletin that I think are important to kind of give us a test. Are we going where God wants us to go? Are we satisfied to be where we're at? Or do we want to go back 20, 30 years ago? I was in Romania back in 1992. And uh, I was preaching, and I looked out to the congregation, and women said over here, and the men said over here, and they had those safari bands. They were brass, uh, you know, trombones and all the brass instruments over here playing. The men played those. Women sang in the choir. Women sat over here. The men sat over here. And there was a pot belly stove right out in the middle. No electricity. They had an old synagogue, and there was a Star of David clearing the back up at the top of the roof. And I never will forget, one of the pastors that was with us, so, oh, man, I wish I had this back in America. Oh, man, I wish. I looked at it, I, you idiot. What's wrong with you? That's the type of church I went to in 1940. We had a little pot belly stove. These little women out there in Romania, boy, they had their coats on, they just grinning like that. I mean, it was fun preaching there, but that isn't what I wanted. I want to move on. Great things. But he wanted to go back there. Oh, I said, man, we could build great. We could? <laughs> you try to get people to come in here, you don't have any heat on, no electricity. It just didn't go to work. Let me give you some things that I think can tell us if we are focused on God like we should be. When we choose transformation over tradition. When we choose transformation over tradition. Now, I don't have anything wrong with tradition. I, um, it's okay. It's all right. But here's the thing. Culture changes. We do not practice church like they did in the early New Testament. Things have changed. But what I'm excited about is transformation. Our lives being transformed. If we're focused on that, not going back to the past, but the future, the children, the young people, transformation taking place in the lives of people. That's what God's interested in. And if we're focused on that, that means we're going in the direction that God wants us to go. Focused on transformation rather than tradition. When we embrace uniqueness over comparing ourselves with other churches. When we accept our uniqueness. You've heard Pastor talk about our uniqueness so many times. You know, I said, well, you know the church across town. Look, that's fine. Whatever part of town it's in. They could run 5,000 and they could run 20. That's not us. They have their identity. We have ours. When we accept our uniqueness, instead of always comparing I never will forget, uh, the one thing in pastoring that always really disturbed me, every time we have new people come to our church, maybe uh, in a couple of months you'd have 10 or 12 new families coming, and they'd look at our bulletin. And they'd always say, well, you know, in our church that we came from, we always put this in there. And I thought, well, you know, if you've got 12 or 13, 15 families coming, you're going to have a funny-looking bulletin if you apply everything that they want you to put in there. You know, and I just say, well, you know, I'm glad that you liked what you had, but this is what we do here. This is our identity. This is our uniqueness. It, it, it's almost like, well, you know, we don't like that church over there because we're coming here, but we want you to know we sure like their bulletins, and this is what they did in their bulletins. Our uniqueness, do we accept that? 
The next one is when we are identified with a solid message rather than a style of music. A solid message than a style of music. Well, I could go a lot of different directions on this one, couldn't I? But here's the deal. I knew it'd get your attention somewhere in this sermon, okay? <laughs> it's got uh, kind of a story I heard one time. This preacher's preaching away, and I don't know, he was telling a story, and he used the word britches, britches, in his sermon. The lady caught him on the way out. She said, I don't like you using the word britches in a sermon. I just don't like that. And the pastor said, well, ma'am, what did I say before I said britches? She said, I don't know what you said before you said britches. Well, what did I say after I said britches? She said, I don't know, and I don't care what you said afterward. He said, well, it's a good thing I said britches. You wouldn't have got anything out of this sermon, would you? <laughs> okay? So now I got your attention. Well, I want to tell you, first of all, the hearts of these guys here, or the ones that's ever been up here since I've been here, I love their hearts. I love their hearts. Music is a big issue to all of us. And it really boils down not necessarily to what God likes, but our preferences. I can remember I teach in Sunday school class one time, was talking about music. And I can remember a lady said, well, I teach my children that the only music they can listen to is the music that Jesus would listen to. I thought, wow, I'd like to pinch her to see how divine she is. How did she know what Jesus would listen to? <laughs> and so I kind of ran that through my mind a little bit, and I got to thinking, you know, what she was telling her kids is, this is the music I want you to listen to, and I know Jesus would like what I listen to. Well, you know, I don't think Jesus makes much difference. You know, I grew up in the old hymns, and I grew up in a quartet family. My grandfather and his three brothers were farmers, and they dressed up in tuxedos and go sing. And uh, they sang at a Billy Sunday revival meeting at the old forum down in Wichita, uh, downtown. And uh, man, they were good. They were good. And then my dad and his brothers, they, I, I used to sit around and listen to them, and then my three sons. And I. But, you know, things are different today. And uh, I've got um, a serious radio, and so I've got a a channel on there that's called Enlightenment. And they've got some good gospel quartet, Southern Gospel. I listened to it on the way in. I got some jazz on there and some blues and the message, which is modern day contemporary music. And, and you know, let me talk to those of my age that, you know, I've thought a lot about music and my personal life. And, and I like contemporary music. I do. I love gospel music, Southern Gospel. I, I, I tell you what, I, uh, music appreciation, I just love it all the way across. A couple of years ago, we had some kids doing some rap up here. You remember they did that? And I, I liked that. And I, I didn't think I'd like rap until I was watching television one day and some Christians were doing some rap, and I listened to the words. And they were probably as good as what John Newton wrote many years ago about Jesus. Sometimes we just tune it out, don't we? But here's the deal. I've got a lot of grandkids and some little great-grandkids coming up. and I finally realized at 76, you know, it's really not about me, even though I like certain things. I want to reach people for Christ. I want to reach young people. And you know, the culture has changed. And I know some, sometimes the music, you know, you scratch your head, you come in, we sit like this, don't we, or whatever it might be. And that's just all part of living. But, but the fact of the matter is, we want to be identified, first of all, with the message that we preach here, that Jesus Christ and him crucified, the salvation of souls, not to be identified with music. And so what happens, sometimes we go through these periods of time because, you know, this church has been going for the last four or five years. We've been going through some real adjustments in that area. And there's been some uncertainty and, and some confusion. And the first thing you know, when we come in, you know, I'm being gentle with this, so listen to me. We come in, I come in with an attitude. 
like, like you know, oh, I get stuff today. Man, I just don't like it. Oh, and, you know, and then I have to think, you know, the people that have been up here, no matter who they are, I just look at their heart. And it's not about me. It's not about, it's about what can we do to reach our culture today with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we do that? Or are we afraid of that? Because it takes me away from going back to Egypt back 50 years ago. And I don't like where I'm at. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do? The next one is this. When we are reaching the lost rather than relating to the consumer mentality. When we're reaching the lost, instead of spending so much time with this consumer mentality. Well, I want this. Well, I'd like to have it this way. Well, you know, at Dillard's, this is the way it is. I go to Walmart. They got it over here. Uh, don't you have any sales? I don't. You know, I go to J.C. Penney's, and they used to have these sales, you know. And then they had a new president. He comes along. He said, we're not going to have any sales anymore. Here's the price. I said, well, I'm not going to shop there. <laughs> if I can't buy it at a bargain, I'm not going to buy it. That's why I quit going there. That's what we do as consumers. And then the last one is when we are hungry to be where God wants us instead of be stagnant where we want to be. To be hungry to where God wants us. Listen to this. Henry Blackaby, experiencing God. Find out where God is at work and join him there. He made these observations. Listen to them. God is always at work around you. God is always working around us. We must recognize that. The second thing he said, God pursues a continuing love relationship with us that is real and is personal. God invites you to become involved with him in his work. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, the church to reveal himself, his purpose, and his ways. God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. Think about that. When God leads us, he is going to lead us into a crisis. You just as well stop and think about that because I guarantee you, if you're going to follow God, there is going to be a crisis. And our faith is going to have to be active if we want to go where God wants us to go. And then the last thing he said, you come to know God by experience as you obey him and he accomplishes his work through you. I want to read from Psalms 100 and and uh, six about Israel. What I just talked about. Listen to this. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. That's why God saved every one of us, not for us, but that his power might be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also. And it was dried up. So he led them through the de depths. He saved them from the hand of him that hated them. He redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his works. They sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. He gave them their requests, but sent leanness into their soul. That is not the identity that we want. Leanness in our soul. We want excitement. Not excitement that we create but excitement that God creates.
in our lives. I'm going to put two more scriptures up. Joshua, chapter 3, verse number 4. Listen to what it says. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, talking about the Ark of the Covenant, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it. In order that you may know the way, you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. And then the last scripture is found in Luke chapter number 10. That we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. And we're to love our neighbor as thyself. So to wrap this up, I want to challenge Glenville. Years ago, in 1978, I had everything taken away from me. I had no job, I had no church, I had no people. I was in a wilderness. I was miserable, uncertainty in my life, and confusion. And I was angry at God. It was out in West Virginia, out by the lake, a little old camper. I was one unhappy man. God had taken people away from me. I'd already pastored for eight years. I went almost a year. And I, I, I said to God, you know, God, if you just give me five people to pastor, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. I don't have to have a big church, immaterial. We didn't have music in our church out in Maryland. We were starting a church. My kids went in and set up chairs every Sunday. We'd have five, six, seven, eight people come from the naval base, wherever it might be, and I'd preach. No offerings coming in. Sometimes when something's taken away from you, it's the best time in the world for you. I thought, you know, God, I don't understand. You called me to pastor, and everything's been taken away. I, I don't understand that. But he sent me in a new direction. I started a new ministry in 1979 in Valley Center. 1983, all hell broke loose. I thought it was bad in West Virginia. It was bad in Kansas. But I wanted to trust God. I wanted to be where God wanted me to be. And he took me on an incredible journey. Changed my life, transformed me. Things that I used to think were so important, they weren't. I wanted to just give my life to reach people for Christ. It wasn't about me coming to church and what I get and what I don't get. Sure, there's certain things I like and I don't like. But you know, at my age, I decided I want my grandkids to go to church. I saw a statement not long ago. Somebody said, Certain generations loved their tradition more than they loved their kids. And so I began, as I saw my, my kids' high school, I began to change. I began to move into music as a little more contemporary because I knew I was about to lose them. I didn't want to lose them. And I thought, we were going to lose a whole generation. I said, well, I took my kids and they didn't lose them. Yeah, that, that, and I'm glad for that. I'm happy for that. But I began to see one of mine kind of go off a little bit, and we wanted to get that corrected in some way. I've been ostracized because I did it. I've been talked about because I did it. But I did it with a pure heart because I wanted to reach a new generation for Christ. I hear we want, we'll be voting here. Next couple of weeks, you'll be listening to politicians up here. And that, that's great. I'm glad. Let me tell you something. They're not going to save the world. Jesus Christ is going to save the world. Save it. I appreciate a good politician. I really do. But it's not about them. It's about Jesus and changing lives and then changing culture and changing society and families. That's how it's done. And sometimes you have to tweak it just a little bit to do that. I'm thinking about the future of Brennan getting ready to start the small groups, the community groups. It's a new direction we're going. You just say, well, I don't, I don't, you know, it's Sunday school, 9 o'clock. Look, 
You know why Sunday school started at 10 o'clock years ago? The reasoning behind that is because we were in an agricultural society. The farmers had to milk their cows in the morning. And so they chose to go at 10 o'clock in the morning. I, when I was pastoring, I tried to change that to 9.30. Somebody, no, no, 10. Well, where's that in the Bible? It wasn't in the Bible. It, you know, it says Sunday school. Well, Robert Rake started that a couple hundred years ago. It's not in the Bible. You can't take this away because it's in the Bible. Really? You know, but you try to get these young people here at 9 o'clock in the morning? Wow, I tell you what, they're still in bed. They've been up watching movies and playing with their technology. And, and so sometimes you just have to change. I know it hurts, but, you know, the small groups, as we'll be going, and there'll be more talked about them. And, and, you know, God's going to do a great thing. But here's the question. Do we want to stay where we're at? Kind of just flounder, wallow around in our own self-pity? Or do we want to go back? Or, this is what I'd like to see us do. Take off on a journey like flying to the moon. God, we don't know what it's going to be like, but I'm excited about it. Let me get on board. Let's go. Things could happen. Let's get excited about what God can do in our life. I really challenge us as a church. To say, you know, it's really not about me. Really, it's about God. And about God, what he wants to do with us. In my discipleship class this morning, we were talking about the sovereignty of God. I thought about, just think when the mother of Moses put him in that little, that little ark. He was send him down the river. Boy, she had to trust God with that little boy, didn't she? Wonder where he's going. <laughs> the Nile River's flowing pretty good. Well, guess what? There's a lady down there washing, and she sees this little old, uh, ark and little baby in there, and she pulls it out. And, what am I going to do with this little baby? Oh, I'll find somebody to take care of this little baby for me. Well, here's Moses' mother. Hey, would you take care of this little baby? You see what God can do? Huh? Isn't it neat? Most of us don't trust our children with God. We're in control. Just think what God was able to do. And so I challenge you, maybe here today, you know, I always prayed in 40-some years of pastoring that I would finally preach a message that was so powerful. Everybody would run to the altar and say, oh, man, I want to change my life. Well, I realized 40-some years ago that wasn't going to work. But I would ask you to do this, and Joey's going to come. We're going to sing a song. Why don't you listen to the words of this song? Justin. These guys got great hearts. I love these two guys to death. Don't like to play golf with them, I guarantee you. <laughs> but as we sing today, I, you know, I think the one thing that God wants us to have is unity. That, that is another identity that God wants for us. And maybe as they're singing right where you're at, just say, you know, God, <laughs> may not be what I want, may not be, but I want what God wants for my own personal life and for the life of this church. And then let's move forward. Let's grab a hold in September when we move forward some more. Let's see what God's able to do. About 18 months ago, Pastor and I were on our way to Kansas City. I challenged him. I bet he thought, I wish he hadn't been in the car. I said, you know, Bruce, you're 50 some years old. You got a lot of years left in your ministry. And I said, I don't think you've reached your potential yet. But I really believe this. Within five or six years, this whole building should be filled twice at least on Sunday morning. But it won't happen until we say, okay, Pastor Bruce, we don't know what's going on, but I'm going. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of preaching this morning. Father, I pray that you'll take what I couldn't do. And Father, you'll speak to our hearts. Father, that we might be lifted up in our thinking and in our hearts to be elevated to where we see you more clearly. We can be focused on you, not the things that we see on the stage or whatever it may be, the ministries that we have. Focused on God. Father, your Holy Spirit.
this morning. Might you just do a work in our lives. Help us to find the, the identity that you want for us at Glenville. I know you're excited to do that. I know you want a people that will say, yes, God, this is what we want. Father, impress that upon our hearts today. May the Holy Spirit of God just be so powerful. Father, we will say, God, I have no idea where you're taking us, but so be it. I want to be on the train. God bless this time this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand if you would, please. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your transition of something and the church always goes through transitions whether it's musically or, or pastorally or something there's always something that takes place and um, we sent out some surveys to the church and many of you filled out those surveys and in those surveys we were talking about likes and dislikes within the church and the direction and the identity of the church and and we got hundreds of those surveys back and as I was looking at those surveys, we passed them out through the deacon board meetings, and we started evaluating who the church was in the perception of the audience. And there were all kinds of perceptions and ideas and thoughts and likes and dislikes, and uh, a lot of those things were you know, very cutting to, to me and to different things. So we started looking at those from a, from a perspective of not 
my perspective, but what's best for the church's perspective? And in doing so, that's where we started to look at the identity of the church and the direction that the church was going to go. One of them, I, couldn't have, I can't imagine somebody saying this, but they actually said this, that the people on the stage are too old. <laughs> I'm, I'm 50 years old, I'm not too old, but we took identity of that, so we started looking at that, and I said, well, if I'm 50, Al's like way older than I am, so he can never be on the stage. And so we started looking about the identity of the church and the perception of who's on the stage, on who's communicating. So, so we brought some young buck in here that's 20-some years old and let Brennan come on the stage a little bit and let him speak. And we started looking about the, the ministries. We started looking at the Sunday school ministry. We started looking at the music ministry, the preaching ministry. One of them said that, Bruce, you preach too much. You need to have other people preach. And so we started looking at all these things that were coming in on the, on the, on the vision of the church. So I wanted to take a look at all of those things, and I wanted to ask God to open my eyes to the direction of the church, because one thing that has overwhelmingly motivated me in my life was this, I never want to become stagnated. In my personal life, and in the church life, I want to be moving towards where God wants me to go at all costs, at all times. When I was a youth pastor, I was never satisfied staying at one place. I always wanted to do something new and something fresh. I wanted to change things every year. I never wanted anyone to ever look at my ministry and say, man, you're just dead. I didn't want somebody walking into the church and say, you guys are just dead. I want somebody walking in the church and say, wow. I want what you have. I want to experience the power of God that you have within your church. When we look and we evaluate, we have to look at what is the purpose of the church and where are we going? I would like to tell you, I knew everything. I, when we started these changes, I knew exactly where we were going to go six months ago. But I tell you, every night and every morning when I'm praying, I say, Lord, I don't know what to do here. I'm, we're looking for a worship pastor, and I can't find a worship pastor. I've been praying. I've been making phone calls. I've been talking to everybody in the world looking for a worship pastor. I can't find a worship pastor. But yet, we're going to start changes in September, and we don't have a worship pastor. And, and Joey's moving all the way away, and, and Jeremy's going to be gone in September. And what are we going to do? So I, oh, I'll figure something out. You know what I have to rely on? I have to rely on, Lord, I need you to lamp, be a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. I may not be able to see six months from now, but I can see right in front of me today. And as long as I trust in God today, he is not gonna put me off course today. And if I trust him today, he's gonna be with me tomorrow. So I have to trust in him every step of the way. Do I know what the, the, the look, the aesthetic look of Glenville is gonna look like a year from now? I know what I want it to look like, but just because I want it to be that way, doesn't mean that's what God wants it to be. Just because you have an idea doesn't mean that's what God wants it to be. What we have to have is exactly what Al preached today. We have to have an identity. And our identity is, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I put my faith, I put my life, I put my identity in the power of God. I may not like everything that Pastor Bruce does. I may not like everything Glenville does, but you know what they do? They preach Jesus. You know what they do? They proclaim the name of Christ. You know what they do? They're never going to become stagnant. You know why? It's because they have a passion, and that passion is to do whatever it takes to reach as many people as you can for the cause of Jesus Christ. And if I am going to fail, I'm going to fail going down swinging for the cause of Jesus Christ. You will never hear Glenville stop preaching Jesus. You will never hear of Glenville being so lackadaisical that they never proclaim the truth and transforming power that Jesus Christ through the word of God can do within people's lives. If we ever get to the point that we are not proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ, you can fire me and I will walk out that door tomorrow because it's bigger than me. It's all about him. That is the identity of the church. Thank you, Pastor Al. Let's do it together. All right, man, will you walk your way down here and we'll be taking up the uh, offerings. Hey, we'll talk about identity. Let me just keep on going for a second, okay? Everybody say amen.
Okay. You say, Bruce, would you just preach the message so you don't have to preach the second message? But I got to say this too. So if it's an identity of the church, do you know why the church can't do everything it needs to do? It's because the identity of the church, you're sitting on it. You're sitting on the resources that you have, that we have. If we would say, Lord, I want you to be glorified in everything that we do, you know what we could do? <laughs> we could hire a worship pastor. <laughs> some, some, some of you older guys, we could have a mini Nate, if you know who Nate is. He's our old worship. We could have a, a mini Nate. We could have somebody else. What we want is we want God to glorify us within our budget but what we want is we need God to use us as a team, as a community, as a group to give our resources, tie to our Lord, so we can continue to do what God has called us to do. It takes resources. We have those resources. What we must do is we must identify that my life, my family, my wealth is God's. So what I have asked, what God has asked, is give a portion of that wealth back to the work of God so they can do, so we can reproduce, so we can look 5, 10, 15 years down the road, so we can do what God has called us to do. It's not about today. It's about what we can do, what we can continue to do, what we can, we can transform people's lives because of what we have today. That's what we have to do within the offerings. We take an offering not to pay the bills, we're taking the offering to show God that we love him and we're willing to be used of him so he can be a conduit to give you more resources so God can do greater things through you. And when God does greater things through you, then God can do greater things through the church. It is a revolving door. It is the hardest aspect of ministry is this right here, is having resources to do ministry effectively, reaching more people for the cause of Jesus Christ. Not preaching on money. We're not coming to church so you give your money. We're coming to church so we have a passion and love for God. In doing so, we can do more things. But I want you to know, if it's an identity, is your identity in Christ only in church? Or is your identity in Christ in every aspect of your life? And the way that God can honor you is if you abandon him Abandon your will and go to him and say, everything is yours. I want my identity to be Jesus. They knew they were with Christ because they had love one for another. And when we have been with Christ, when we have experienced him, it will be known to others that Christ is real within our life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we really want you to feel comfortable. But more than I want you to feel comfortable... I want you to be stirred. I want you to know that God wants to work within your life. We're not here to play church. What we're here to do is to challenge us, to become the person, to become the group of individuals that have a passion for Christ that will be changed from the core, not just changed emotionally, changed to the core to do something great for the cause of Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your love to us. I ask you to guide within the church. I ask you to guide individually. That when we take our DNA, we would bleed. They would read follower of Christ, a disciple, a lover of the Lord, a member of his entity called the church. So Lord, be with us. Allow us to be stirred. Allow our identity to be placed firmly within us that we know without a doubt that we're your child. We know without a doubt that you've called us, you've equipped us, you set us apart, you're enabling us to do something great and mighty for the cause of Christ. Allow the identity of the group of individuals called Glenville Church to stand up and be accountable to every action, to do great and mighty things, to be who you want us to be. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.